thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. I'm also very happy to be moderating this uh, debate since um, it's, it's a, a, an odd mixture, actually, I think, when you're talking about strategy, because we have three entrepreneurs, uh, young startup companies, and then we have one old timer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can call them that. Um, and I, um, I'm going to, going to introduce oh. them one by one and calling them up here. Mm. I think we're going to start with ladies first. So uh, joining me on stage, please, uh, Karina Schmidtland, come closer. Karina is the founder and CEO of uh, Winter Spring. Um, I went to her LinkedIn profile the other day and her skills we're all about financial stuff. It's, uh, it says you're good at fixed income, capital markets, and uh, credit sales. And you've also had a, an impressive career in uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and you've been in uh, Morgan Stanley. But uh, suddenly, she decided to try something new. So she started a company that makes ice desserts. It's very different from investment banking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll hear a lot more about that. So thank you, Karina. Um, also uh, joining us is uh, Mette Lugge. Come on up here. <laughs> Mette, you're here. Mette is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Endomondo. She actually graduated from uh, Aarhus University in uh, political science, I believe. And um, she worked for McKinsey and Company. But then suddenly she... Uh, decided to get off the beaten track. She quit her day job and she co-founded Endomondo in 2007. They had a rough start because uh, no one would give them uh, capital, but uh, they succeeded and today uh, Endomondo has 26 million users worldwide, you just told me. I bet some of you use it when you're running and bicycling and uh, yeah, we all pretty much know it. Thank you, Mitty. Um The gentleman today, let's take the old timer, Peter Tubo, come closer. <laughs> Peter is the CEO of, uh, of Arla, and he, uh, he's been there since 2005 in this position. He uh, steered the company th through a lot of rough times, um, most famously the, the crisis in, uh, in, yeah, in, in, uh, in, the in the aftermath of the satirical Muhammad drawings. And um, since then, he's uh, had a, a very ambitious growth strategy. Um, and he actually uh, he excelled in it because uh, the target was a revenue of 75 billion uh, before 2015, but he already reached that last year. So uh, a very cool gentleman joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, Morten Stronger. <laughs> Morten, you're here. Uh, Morten, um, Morten founded uh, Unphone, which you probably know, the, the mobile company. It served as a game changer. I just, uh, when I was reading about you, Morten, I read that um, you initiated a price war that actually cost the industry uh, roughly two and a half billion Danish krona. So I guess there's a lot of uh, angry uh, mobile phone CEOs out there when they think <laughs> about you. But uh, he sold on phone to TDC in uh, 2011, which made him uh, a millionaire. But he didn't uh, kick back and, and rest. Instead, he, uh, he went on, and in 2013, he founded Mofibo, an ebook company. So uh, this is our panel for today, and uh, we'll be uh, doing all of your questions in just a, a while. Uh, to start up, I have one question. Well, actually, I have two questions for all of you. Um, the first question is, how do you define strategy? What is strategy to you, and how does it play a role in your company? And I think we should start with you, uh, Karina. Sure. Um, so how do I define strategy? Uh, to me, I started out very basic. I had a vision. And that was a point somewhere out there. And my strategy was how to get there. And starting up a business like mine, doing, oh, to do the same quality ice desserts that you get at the best, best restaurants, I had loads of setbacks. I mean, every day there was a setback. But as long as we kept going, it took two years to develop my root was my strategy, and my strategy was the root to my vision. But did you sit down in the beginning and write down a strategy and decided this, this is how I'm going to do it? And, and did you do it in, in a lot of steps? Or how do you how do, you do that? Um, so I worked very much according to whatever came against me on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So I adjusted my strategy to whatever obstacle I had in front of me. My vision stayed the same. I wanted to bring this product to the market. 
I started with the Danish market, and that was my vision. And my strategy then changed according um, to obstacles. One example could be that the production site couldn't deliver the quality I wanted, or I couldn't get the ingredients I wanted. I was in constant competition with the best restaurants for where I bought my, quali my, my ingredients. And that's just a sort of a practical example of what I would face of obstacles. And I think, uh, as an entrepreneur, your flexibility is to go against whatever obstacles and keep going on your strategy, on your route to your vision. What about you, Peter? You, uh, you come from a pretty different starting point, and you've been through uh, a couple of strategies actually already in, in yeah. Arla. What does it mean to you? Actually, in a, I, get, I sense that it's the same thing, but I would then express it maybe in a different way because I have to speak to so many markets and, 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 and people, so, so it, it becomes, in that sense, maybe a more boring kind of uh, way of, of, of talking about it. But it, it, it basically is the same. It, 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 it must start with, uh, as I showed this, this uh, uh, afternoon also, with a mission and a vision, the reason for being, something that you dream about. Yeah. And even a big corporate artifice can dream about something, at least I can. Uh, and, it ha and that dream must be somehow uh, ambitious. Uh, you, you want to raise yourself. That could be size-wise, as we have done, but it could also be into an area that you, you, know, you dream of or uh, an ambition or a set of competences that you want to ac uh, acquire. But I think also it has to be demand-driven, otherwise you know, it goes nowhere. You won't be able to make money out of it. <laughs> so, so there must be a demand out there. You have to understand it. And then I believe that strategy basically, and that's maybe the corporate side, must be kind of a, a framework of, uh, of tasks uh, that uh, you can actually, from the top, drill down into more and more specific uh, actions and things that happen and projects and what do I know. That's what I need. Uh, so, so it starts there and then it has to be interpreted uh, and I have to have a certain set of KPIs that follow up whether we are actually you know, doing something that reaches the vision and the ambitions, or are we just, you know, working and going and going nowhere? So it has to be measurable. But then it also, and that's maybe the, the, the something which could be surprising, it has to be agile. It, I mean, planning everything in detail is just impossible. You, you hardly can't do that a year ahead. But you can have a, an idea of where you're going, and that idea should drive you. And then you have to have be agile and uh, have the courage to change your mind on the way, not on the big way, on where you want to be, but how you do it. Uh, close down projects and open up new projects and, and, and have the courage. That's what I s call, you know, there must be some agility in the, uh, in the strategy you're working with. And that's why I'm very fond of a framework, of a strategy which is a framework that releases some energy in the company. And, 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 that's, and where I can get surprised of solutions to a strategic issue. Do you uh, confess to any, uh, I mean, specific the strategic designs or theories when you sit down and, and make your new strategy for the next three, four, five years? I, I, I've for many years worked with something called LOTS, L-O-T-S, which is uh, an idea of how you work process-wise with your strategy. It, it, it has no fancy models, but it's just you have to go through a certain f set of frequencies, you know, your vision, you have to describe that know where you are, want to want to be, uh, you have to be able to describe and analyze where am I then today before you start setting specific targets and think about your organization. So it's, it's more of a process tool that so it clicks in my head as, oh, we are here now, uh, so let's discuss this. And then people are jumping ahead of me and I said, listen, we're not finished with this. We need to understand where we are and not where we're going. Uh, we can talk about that later. So it's a process tool, but it's not a, you know, what you learn. <laughs> it still sounds. Uh, it still sounds very <laughs> organized, Medelugia. And that's not because it's not valuable. <laughs> it's just because I'm a simple guy. I just need to govern that process. And then we have people who are just as bright as you are, and they work with all the tools. <laughs> <laughs> Medelugia, what about you? And when you started Endomondo, what did you do strategically? Did you sit down and, like Karina, make a, a blueprint, or what did you do? Uh, yeah, we did. So we, we didn't have any money at all to put into this when we first started out. So we had to find investors. So we had a very nice business plan. Uh, coming from McKinsey, we had an easy time making very beautiful slides. Uh, and we got all the meetings with the VCs, <laughs> but uh, it was like no money followed those meetings. Uh, so we just had to keep on working on our own strategy. And, um, and there were a lot of things to consider because uh, we started a market that didn't really exist. 
and there were naysayers all over the place. The people would tell us almost on a daily basis that it was way too soon, GPS technology wasn't advanced enough yet, uh, maybe if we came back in three years, they would consider it. Uh, or they said, uh, who in their right mind would bring a phone when they go for a run? Uh, that was another thing we kept hearing. So uh, we really had to think strategically about it. But then at the end, we just followed our passion and uh, we just believed that. So you uh, stuck to your initial strategy? Yeah. So. I mean, one thing is vision and mission, and those things are kind of easy, and they never change, at least for us. It's been seven years now. But the strategy changes every year, year and a half um, for us. So, Morten Stronger, the, the investment banker, the CEO, and the McKinsey uh, corporate uh, rep representative, they all have a different take on strategy. You uh, graduated from high school. That's it, education-wise, for you. <laughs> what did you do when you had to sit down and, 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 and make a strategy? Um, I think that now we, we have a framework as well. We understand which drivers should be in our strategy. Uh, we spend a lot of time about talking about our vision and, and defining our vision. Uh, I think for me, it's, it's I haven't read any books about strategy at all. Uh, though I have a book business, I've only read like 10 books in my life. Uh, <laughs> but I've been at TDC for two and a half years where I learned a lot about corporate and how they work with strategy within corporate, uh, which is actually really, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from that and which we've used in Mofibo as well. But for me, strategy is, is extremely important that you remember the customers. It's extremely important that, you, that, you, that your employees understand which in which direction you're, you're going. Uh, I see a lot of companies focusing more about having the right story towards their shareholders than making a strategy and creating a strategy which their employees actually understand. Mm -hmm. And that should be priority one, two, and three because you get a much more effective uh, uh, organization if they actually understand how they should act in the day uh, and which direction they, uh, which what creates value for the company. Can you give any examples? Uh, I mean, what what differs uh, the two strategies? The one for the uh, for the stakeholders and the one for the employees. Um, I think we do have a very clear strategy towards the stakeholders because we are a company. Uh, we are spending shitloads of money uh, and are going to invest a lot of money in going into new markets. So we have to raise money at all times. We're actually raising money at the moment. Um, so we have to be very clear in terms of what creates value for the for the shareholders. And, and integrate that into our, our, our plans as well. Uh, if we, we might have some brilliant idea of where we want to go, but if, 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 there are sh if the shareholders, they don't agree in, in terms of what creates value, then we won't get the money and we'll close down the project. Um, so we do believe, a we work a lot with, with the, the shareholders, but I believe even more in, in, in it's much more important that the employees they actually understand, especially when you're a small company, uh, they need to know which direction you're going and, and why they actually work for you. Uh, then they sit and work all weekend, they sit and work till late at night and so on. Mm. And then they work on the right things and not the wrong things. I want to ask you one more question before we turn to the, the questions from the audience. Uh, because you're all here because you have s you've had success with what you're doing and your success stories. But uh, I want to know if you've ever had a failure with your strategy. And I know, uh, Mette Lugge, we talked about this just before we came down here. And you said, oh, yeah, there's been like <laughs> plenty. So, so what has that meant for you that, that you've had some, some failures? Well, the, the main, the, I think the biggest strategic mistake we made was uh, some years ago, we, of course, you know, being a tech startup, we had no clue how to make money. We just wanted a lot of users. And then we thought, you know, we'll figure it out as we go along. Um, but then when we, um, when we then started thinking about what should the business model be, uh, at some point we went into hardware, which was really uh, not a clever move at all. Uh, we're good at software. I think we figured out how to do that okay-ish. <laughs> but, uh, but going into hardware for us meant starting an apparel collection. Uh, we even started producing heart rate uh, monitors. And it's just a completely different ball game, and it's super competitive, so it costs a lot of money. Um, to to go down that path, and it's really for me. It's been, I think, the money has been well spent <laughs> in the sense that I learned a lot, and uh, we are not ever gonna get defocused like that again. <coughs> is it my microphone being weird? Oh, yeah, I think yeah. maybe it is. Maybe it is. So we'll get some, get someone to look at it. Uh, meanwhile, I'll ask you, Peter Tuborg. You've you've been the strategic game a bit longer. Are there any pitfalls regarding strategies? I mean, anything that you can say, don't do that. 
No, uh, no, 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 but I have had my chance or my part of, of, of failure is not something that I normally advertise. So it's a bit surprising uh, to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let me tell you uh, one story uh, of uh, one of the, the things that I had on my list uh, the last, uh, in, the last in that strategy we had for five years since 2008 was to uh, create uh, a big Arla Foods in Poland. It was very important to us uh, to get farmers, to get, you know, it's very close to us and uh, could be dangerous because, you know, uh, they can produce cheap. So, so we wanted to be part of that. And uh, I never forget, and I think it was in 2009, uh, that we sat together on the 22nd of December and I had prepared everything. And, and uh, the papers were there and we had had tons of meetings. Uh, and then I got my farmer board together with the farmer board of the, the opponent, you can say it turned out to be an opponent. And, and we had Christmas, Christmas gifts. It was in Copenhagen. It was uh, at Rødhusplads, and it was wonderful. Uh, and, and, and halfway through the dinner, uh, ready to sign, the chairman stood up and said, we ha are not ready yet. And then it all turned very sour. Uh, and one of the reasons that I really, I, I had forgotten that, that the owners really were in Poland, they were farmers, they were not ready actually to be part of something that was not Polish. So that was a cultural thing actually. All the business people, all the business was right. It, we, were, we were in full agreement with each other. It was, uh, I mean, it was fantastic for them actually. But culturally, I had forgotten to understand them. That's a once in a lifetime. I'll never do that again. Uh, so we, we packed together. We didn't have the Riz uh, We went home. <laughs> uh, damn, actually. <laughs> What about you, uh, Karina? Any uh, any epic fails in, uh, oh, yeah. in winter springs beginning? <laughs> um, well, my my company is still very young, um, but I thought I'd share with you today this absolutely humiliating uh, situation I had six months ago, which was we are very close to the end of our uh, product development. In fact, you can I could bring samples to this presentation, which was with a very large capital fund, an equity fund, um, and I was looking for an investor. And I came in, I made the call, they took me in, all the senior partners there were was present, and as you know now, my background is banking, so I'm used to these sort of meetings. And I had a great presentation with me, including ice desserts of a certain standard. And I did the presentation, at the end, the guy who was the most senior, he put down his pen and he said, Karina, it's not going to work. Why don't you come and work for us and give that up? And I, I was speechless, because I thought I did brilliant, and I thought my vision was very clear, and I thought I could take this company anywhere in the world, and the guys just co totally closed down my idea and my strategy of getting an investor on board now. And I went home, I, I, by then I've, I financed everything up to that point, and I said to my husband, that's it, I'm going to be stupid now, but I'm going to be ruthless, I'm going to invest, I'm going to go all in, this is my company and I believe in it. And that changed everything. But it was different because I didn't think that was my strategy and I had to change strategy. And now I don't need an investor. And that's why I could bring this product to the market, which was in my way the best way. But of course it was a huge setback. I mean, I'm standing here laughing, but it was humiliating. And also I realized I wasn't easy, it wasn't easy for me to explain to people where I wanted to take it. And um, yeah, and, and in two weeks I'm going to New York and I'm meeting a strategic partner, not a money partner as such. And I know it's going to be different. It's sort of a classic tale actually, isn't it? Oh that, that yes. You have to go into some very strong headwind before you can actually say, this is what I want to do. You get yeah. your, your target straight. What about you, Morten Stronger? Does it apply to you too? Or is it in somewhat a cliche? Um, yeah, I think I have my share of failures. Um, I, um, I think one of them is, is uh, Agnes, the, the cupcake company, which I don't now don't know why I bought, um, <laughs> but I I did and you I didn't. Make uh, it's a big mistake. I didn't use enough time on, on analyzing the case before it was a, a company going bankrupt, so I had to move fast. Uh, but I didn't uh, I didn't dive into the figures as much as I should have, uh, and I actually didn't close down the company. Uh, after buying the company, I should have looked into the. I did look into the company. I got quite surprised at what actually was going on in the company. But then I decided, okay, I have to try to turn turn it around. Why I should have actually said, okay, this won't work. I should close it down straight away. Uh, and I kept the company going for for uh, uh, a year or so and uh, lost uh, quite a lot of money on that. Uh, so I think that's a. 
you have to admit your mistakes straight away. I think that's what actually what big companies are very good at. They're very good at laying down a strategy and then <laughs> sticking to it, no matter what, and not sacrificing the projects uh, fast enough, which doesn't work, and so on. Uh, so, so I think it's very common both for small com companies, but also for the big ones. They're very good at, at, at uh, not revising the strategy often or not enough and, and uh, not admitting that they actually <laughs> chosen the wrong path or the wrong project or whatever. So. But has it scared you off from investing in, in, uh, in, in branches or categories uh, that you don't necessarily know anything about? Uh, I think I shouldn't go into uh, physical stores and into beverages and so on. I've had a, a, a cupcake company which went bankrupt and I had a beer company. So I think I'll stick to something with subscriptions <laughs> or and online based. <laughs> but apart from that, I'm still <laughs> very happy to invest and, and to go out into new uh, ventures. Okay, I think we should turn now to uh, some of the questions that uh, the audience has uh, has delivered. I think actually we're going to start with the one um, with the most votes. Uh, Peter, you were talking about uh, that you that you didn't embrace the culture enough when you had your new uh, your new strategy. And um, this question is actually about that culture eats strategy for breakfast. True or false? So, Peter, uh, I think it's true. natural to start with you. It's true. <laughs> what do you do about it? But you can't separate the two, and that's what's wrong with the question. Yeah. Uh, if you did want to choose one or the other, yen, then the question is, of course, yes, because there's much more sustainability in culture. But, but the two belong together. A good strategy also uh, understands the values and the cultural elements of what you're doing uh, and the markets you're approaching. So they go hand in hand and don't eat each other. Maybe and that's what I forgot, by the way, in Poland. But so many other things went well. <laughs> Middelug, you're still you're still a small company. But, uh, you do have a, a, a couple of employees. I think it's around 30. It's 40. 40. Sorry. Um, it was 30 uh, last you asked. Okay. <laughs> how do you? I mean, how do you ensure that your strategy goes hand in hand with with the culture that that you are growing? I I think it's a lot easier when you have a small company, and uh, it's easier when you are a startup because the people you bring in. They only join because they believe what you believe. Most of the time, they're going to take a salary cut uh, if they came from another job. So they do this because they're very passionate about it. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's, it's a lot easier in a startup because we're really living the vision uh, all day long. Working at McKinsey, I worked with strategy in a very different type of corporations, uh, you know, the size of, uh, of Peter's Arla. And uh, there it really is, uh, it can be quite tricky because you have so many layers and you really need it to be bottom up and not just top down. Hmm. Morten, uh, how do you define culture in, in, in when you're starting a company? Do you, do you define it or does it create itself? Um, I think it creates itself for me. Uh, I'm very, uh, I put a lot of effort into to, to creating the right culture. Uh, as uh, Meta said we would uh, be paying a lot more uh, in salary uh, if we didn't have the culture we had. Uh, we would be seeing people uh, coming at 9 o'clock and leaving at, at 4 o'clock and not leaving at, at 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, so I think it's, it's for us as a small company culture is extremely important because you have to push your employees to a great degree because you just want to move forward and you want to accelerate as, as fast as possible. So it's extremely important that, that the employees are there for another reason than money. They have to be there because they love the vision, they love the idea, they love the team, they love all that. Um, but, yeah. Karina, what's your take on it? Culture versus, or does it imply I, strategy? To be honest, when I read the question, I didn't get it because I don't separate the two. And I think the culture of the company, particularly when you're young, when the company is young and you're very small, uh, small being less than 50 people, it's so important that you embrace a culture where everyone gets what you're doing. And of course they do because you're full of passion and you're the owner of the business. Uh, Mort and I coming up here today, we talked about him hiring a, a senior person and taking someone from another company and put them into your company and make them believe and trust everything you do. For a lot of people, that's a huge sacrifice. That's outside their comfort zone. And we as entrepreneurs, are, are we kind of embracing that. We want them because we need their knowledge, but we're also well aware that we have to create a culture that makes them feel safe and of course need it because we need them. Mm. The other thing about culture is say, no one loves your company more than you. And you have to step back and, and understand that. So whoever you hire is never going to be you. 
but someone who could almost do your job, but with less passion. And in the beginning, I found that really hard. I couldn't understand why someone wasn't reading emails at 2 a.m. Because I was. And why, was, why were they not researching the same ingredients or something else or techniques? Because I was. But of course, how could they? How could I put that on, put that on them when it's, it wasn't their company, it wasn't their vision? Having said that though, I think we all hire people that look a lot like ourselves. And the culture we create is a reflection of us. Peter, you wanted to get back on that? Yeah, I think that, that and, and there's absolutely no difference between being a corporate big creature like us and, 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 and a smaller company like, like, like what you're representing. Uh, no strategy works if the culture doesn't work and if the culture is not clear. And you won't be able to attract the right people either. And there will be people who enjoy working mm. with Ala Foods and you know, they will give anything to work with us. And those who say, no, that's not a place for me. And that's actually very fine because that tells me that then we stand for something at least, also <laughs> as a big company. And that's very important. That's what I spoke about this morning because what is culture? Culture is also what your brand represents. It's your branding value, it's your leadership style, it's, it's the whole HR community, of course. Uh, it's the identity of the company as well, also the outside identity, all, not only what goes inside. And the beauty is, big or small company is, if you can get your identity, your inner DNA, call that culture or whatever, I call it the DNA, if you can get that into helping you make business outside, that's when the agents really start uh, to sing, uh, and, and that is right, that is difficult in a big company, but nevertheless it's needed. And big surprise, I spend minimum 50% of my time on HR issues, on, my, on, uh, on value issues, and the rest is strategy and occasionally visiting customers. Okay. I think we have a question from the audience. In line with this, um, we all agree, or I think most would agree, that many changes um, or many strategies that fails comes from within the culture when people have uh, disabilities or unwillingness to change. Um, do you have any examples from your uh, strategy implementations where they failed in this regard? Good question. I think we should start with you, uh, Mette Lugge. Um, I don't, I, I don't think we've had any examples of the strategy failing because of the culture. We've had examples of the strategy failing because of leadership and bad strategy. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't think we have in terms of the culture. Um, but we, we have been through uh, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, we, uh, we were in a position where we were running out of cash uh, a little bit too quickly, from my taste, and we had to... Uh, to cut uh, quite a bit of cost, so we had to let go of uh, a third of our team, basically, at that time. Uh, and that was really tough. Uh, of course, it's tough to let people go, but it was especially tough to build up the team spirit afterwards, uh, with two thirds left and a lot more people left voluntarily, uh, because uh, there's nothing easier uh, than, uh, than for an engineer to get a new job. <laughs> I mean, they can always start on Monday somewhere else. Uh, so that was really tough, um, but it took eight, nine, ten months, and now I think we have a culture that's, we have a much bigger team now, but we also have a, a much stronger culture because we've been through that exercise. Karina, mm. you say that uh, your, your work is easier because uh, you're a startup company, which means the culture is, is stronger. What do you do to ensure that the culture remains strong? I mean, in the future, so that you don't have failures because you don't have a, mm. an alignment between the two. I think one important thing that I learned from banking was that you share the ins and outs of what's going on. And you sit down and you spend the time and you make the effort of explaining what's going on, what, what's happening. And with that, you just show passion because it is your business. And you share the idea of where you want to take it next, what markets you're looking at. You also plant seeds for your employees to grow with you take responsibility, um, find new products um, that wherever they exist. I have an employee who came to me not, not long ago and said, look, this is happening in Norway. We've got to look at this. It's not far from where we are doing and so on. And I didn't ask him to do that, but I could tell he's just out of passion. He investigated it himself. He found it somewhere and it made sense to him that we had a chat about it. And I think by being honest and showing who you are and where you're coming from in good and bad ways, you are kind of feeding into that culture you're trying to
built. Um, the other thing I say is that no matter what level and no matter what you do, you have to share that. It doesn't matter if someone is senior or junior, you share. And the culture is important as much for the senior person as the junior person. Peter, you have thousands of employees. I guess you can't sit down and, and <laughs> be sure they all share the same culture. No, and I'm actually coming back to the question down there because I think that I have, I have something that, that inspired me from, from the world I come from, uh, from Ala Foods. Ala Foods, the, the foundation of the Ala Foods that you, you know today was created in the year 2000 after through the 90s, mergers and mergers in Denmark. That was when we were known, probably still are, but, but in an unnice way uh, as the giant. Uh, and, and, uh, and then there was a merger between the big Danish company and an almost as big company in Sweden. That's the foundation of Arla Foods that we know today. And, and at that time, management, and I was actually part of it, uh, not the CEO, but I was part of the management uh, at, a, at a slightly lower level. We were very occupied on you know, hard synergies. Uh, there was a ton of, sorry, uh, don't say to anybody, but there was a ton of money to be made in hard synergies, really getting efficiency out of the company. You know, all that thing, which is as far away from culture as you can get, or branding, but really getting you know, the inner synergies right. And a lot of money, and we should work on that. But we actually, for a period, forgot two, three years, or didn't have time to, you can say, to actually get together and say, this company, which has been built very rapidly of different cultures, what is actually the inner DNA of that? And I remember there was a saying in Arla Foods that we are, a, that we are a group of merger of among equals. That, that's, that's rubbish. There is no, because that's, you know, saying that the cultures, that we, there are so many cultures and they're different, that they're all equal. And it went haywire actually. No branding strategies, nobody sat together thinking about all the smart things we should do, but we made a lot of money so it was okay. Then in Denmark in 2004 we ran into this big uh, crisis that we had. We had. It was really horrible and our image dropped like hell and it's coming back now again, but, but it's, it, we really had some years of, of toughness. Because we ha and I think it was because we haven't thought about our inner DNA, which made that we, could, we haven't earned the right actually to be so big in the, uh, in, in the fridge back home with, with the with consumers as we are. Uh, and this is why I actually, when I took over in 2005, it could have been anybody else, but a CEO at that time in his right mind would say, stop. Now we need to get back and find out what is the DNA of Arno Foods, mm -hmm. and then get rid of all the other stuff and define the culture. And I spent two years on that. Some of our, the employees said, what, are you mad? You're spending so much time on this together with your HR director. I have the best HR director, don't tell anybody, in the world. And we traveled the world, and we still do, visiting uh, places, talking about all of this, because it's en never en uh, ending. Von Strong, I also want to hear you about this question. Uh, have you had any incidents where your, where your strategy failed because of the culture? <coughs> I think that uh, merging Unphone into uh, the TTC corporation I wouldn't say it failed because we did uh, leave all the, the, the hard uh, stuff in terms of, of, uh, of merging a company and, and, and made a lot of money out of that. But the, the cultural difference between the Unphone company with, with something like 200 employees and a company like TDC uh, uh, didn't go well at all. We really tried to, 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 uh, to prepare ourselves and, and to, to explain uh, the vision and merge the visions and so on. Uh, but but in the first two months, and everybody was very eager and very happy about it to start off with. Uh, but after three months or something like that, it, it became uh, the TDC way or the highway, uh, and and that actually a lot of the, the employees they ended up leaving the company. Uh, because but isn't that sort of natural? I mean, when you it when you natural. merge That's into a big I company, I, I can't. S I wouldn't say that it's it's a failure because it's we expected something like that to happen because it's two different, totally different companies. It was, it was a small company building extreme values and very driven by me as a person and coming into a big company with 8,000 employees where, where you run the company in another way, it has to have some consequences and those people and those profiles of employees, they don't see themselves in a, in a role like that and, and won't ever see them, so it's, it's a natural thing, but mm. I think we could have been a little better, a lot. I think we should take another question from uh, from the audience. It's uh, a lot about ducks and horses. I don't know if my management lingo is uh, is getting a bit tired. I, I'm not sure if it's actually a, a saying. Strategy-wise, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck 
or 100 duck-sized horses, and how would you do it? I'm going to translate this into would you rather meet <laughs> one very big challenge or a lot of small ones in your strategic work? So, Karina, uh, what do you say? Whoa, I don't know. I guess you get hit by both. Truth is, you get hit by both, particularly if you're ambitious, and we all are. That's why we're here, right? I think if you do a globalization, if you take your company global, you'll face this. And would I rather be hit by it? I don't know. I think you have to keep your company on its feet. You have to be really ready to maneuver in whatever th reality throws at you, whatever market you're going to <coughs> entrance. Um, I don't know what else to say, really. I mean, the truth is, when you're small, you can really adopt very quickly, as much as you can with the cash you have. And as much as you like to be a sort of a flexible, you, there is also some, some things that are just not possible. Um, for example, I'm thinking of taking my company, I already have a deal with uh, by Norway, and I, I'm thinking of doing Sweden. That should be a no-brainer. But in fact, it showed me that it's not. And I'm taking a step back from that and l maybe let that happen next year or year after. And there's loads of reasons for that, but I think I'm going to be hit by one horse and a lot of ducks. Neither sounds very nice. <laughs> Peter, I'm going to ask you, uh, the, the crisis uh, related to the satirical Muhammad drawings, I mean, I would call that one huge horse-sized duck. <laughs> what, what was worse, getting hit by that or, uh, or everyday smaller problems? Definitely the big uh, elephant-sized duck. <laughs> I don't understand the question actually, but <laughs> <laughs> but but I think I understand no it. <laughs> but but but, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, that was horrible actually. Uh, kept me uh, quite awake for for some nights uh, over half a year period. But but in terms of competition, if that's what's meant, uh, I, I think you know the tough competition that we have, and I think that's very important that you as a company define your competition. Who's actually my competitor? What market am I in? So that's something that you've read in the book, I'm sure. But, and, and I don't know that the toughest of our peers, that's the Nestlé, the Unilever, some of the really big elephants that we are out with, they, they can hurt us and damage us, and some of the dreams that we have, they can block that. But to be honest, I enjoy every day when some of our employees, for example in Denmark, say, oh, we have a tough uh, competition with Tisa, they just made this and that, and I said, excellent, let them bite you again so that you, to keep you alive. So that's the small dog. And I love those because that they keep us alive and then they actually inspire us. The big other elephants, that's a nasty game on the savannah. If, if we look at it as a, as a compet uh, competition uh, view, Morten, you've been the smaller, smaller challenger to a big business. What did you take from that that you can use? Um, I just want one comment to that. Didn't Ala also build? A, a, a more liking, they, didn't they get more sympathy within the markets you're in, the home markets, Denmark, Sweden and so on, during the Mohammed crisis. So they actually increased your brand liking in those markets. In some, yes, in, and in others not. Actually, we had some problems in Denmark because Denmark was divided in two. Uh, so it was like, you know, having two, uh, hearing program three and program one in, 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 uh, uh, at the same time, uh, and, and we couldn't separate it. Uh, so we, we were loved by some and hated by others. And, and outside of Denmark, they just didn't understand anything. But, but the brand then became quite famous in these markets, and th by that we grew. <laughs> but we lost in the Middle East for some years, I have to admit. Yeah, I wanted to know about being the, being the small challenger. What did that uh, teach you? Um, and coming into a big corporation or... Oh, just, I mean, challenging the market. I mean, you were, uh, yeah, the I Trojan horse of the mobile ma market, I guess. I think what I've learned is that a lot of the big corporations, they, they say that they are customer-centric and focused on the customer, uh, but for real, they're not. They don't know much about their customers, uh, and they don't really care about their customers. Uh, so I think a, a, a big... Being a, a small player, of course, you're, you're faster, you can move faster, you don't have anything to cannibalize and so on. Uh, all, all you create is new revenue and so on. Um, but I think it all, there's always an opening in a lot of the big markets in terms of taking the customer's side and creating and really thinking of the customers and prioritizing him, number one, two, and three. Um, so that's what I've learned also from being within a big company. Uh, it's 
very seldom it's actually customer first. Uh, which but is it possible to keep that strict view on, on your customers when you grow and you get larger and, and you end up being the size of uh, Ala? I think it's hard. I think what I've learned, I was actually uh, I was at with TDC a year longer than I had to. Uh, so it was free will. It was because I actually learned a lot from being with NTC. I love the job. I have a really good network there and I talk with them like every month or so. Uh, and it's a really good company, a health company and so on. Um, but but I think what I learned is, is that... Oh, uh, question again. Well, what did uh, you? Well, uh, is can you keep the view on on uh, strictly on your customers as you grow grow and get and get bigger? I mean, yeah, it's pretty yeah, easy okay. for you to uh, say when you're a small company. Yeah, the problem is, but when you get bigger, for example, when you by being in a company which is uh, on the on the stock, uh, they focus or tend to focus on the next quarter, uh, and that means you make just decisions you take are quite short minded. Uh, where if, if you have a startup, of course you have to focus on your shareholders, but you tend to have a you take the right decisions on the longer run as well. That's a, bi a huge difference. But at some points, when you become big enough and your shareholders have a big enough vote, then you will take decisions where you where it hits your customers. In Unfund, we earned a lot of money by putting small uh, fees on top. Though we were like the pr co the, c the company uh, with a promise that we would uh, have fixed bills and so on, uh, we did put in small fees. But we had 250,000 customers, so a small fee could give us something like 25 million in EBDA a year just by adding a small fee and on, on, on things like that. So we, did, yeah, you do if you're pressured hard enough by stockholders and so on, you do. Unfortunately, uh, you are pushed in that direction. Mirly, hmm. do you have any uh, any take on the on the ducks yeah, and the horses? I <laughs> yeah, I will keep away from the analogy, <laughs> but I think it's true that that you always have both small, medium, and, and big challenges. And, and when you're a CEO, it, it's your job, or it's, I think of my job now as, as only working with the big challenges, so the, the big dogs. And then I try to delegate the rest, and to be frank, a lot of it nobody really addresses, because when you have a team of uh, less than 50 people, you can't do it all. So I, I'm a, aware of at least 20 things we ought to do, but it's just not top of the list at this point. Uh, so I tend to just focus on the two or three most important things. Yes, Peter Suboga. Yes, that, that could also be me, I have to say. But I actually, if I look at, at and that's coming back to the question about competition and, and, and different approaches to the market and where you actually, some places we are very big. Like in Denmark, we have a huge market share, 80%, Sweden 60, UK 45. Middle East, again, yes, uh, 30 to 35% market share, uh, etc. That requires a special set of skills, and, 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 and some people are attracted to that, you know, really be working refined with all of the, the processes and taking care of that. And, and, and we measure them with a certain set of KPIs. You have to be very close on that, and uh, big businesses. But then we have those more entrepreneur type of businesses where, you know, though the people who are setting up uh, our Nigerian thing that we talked about this morning, or Argentina, or here six months from now, or traveling to Kuala Lumpur, getting new people, starting from scratch, you know, just finding an address out there, and they, they, different type of people. They would be probably a disaster in our Danish organization, and, and, and would feel strangled, like you probably, some of you would, and <laughs> others. And, and, but also some of our those who are working on in the more mature markets would be you know, scared of that you know, fantastic uh, opportunity it is to set up something new. It could also be on, uh, on the go categories, which is something that we have really never cracked the nut on. And, and, and that requires a different uh, type of people and a different approach. And I think that the three of you are, uh, represent that different approach. But we actually have that inside Alafus as well. And I just have to hoo -hoo, make sure that I don't, don't ride the horse in the same way, actually. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. I think we should stay on uh, what's inside of you. I'm going to go to this question. You need to have psychopathic characteristics in order to be a CEO. You need True to or false? I'm very anxious <laughs> to hear you answer this one. Karina, let's start with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, definitely not. I mean, today, when I did my s talk, I, I emphasize on why it is so important to be an inspirational leader and inspire others and why you should choose an, a, a leader who inspire you. And no, I don't believe that at all. I don't know why anyone would write that because that kind of goes against all normal thinking, I guess. Well, 
I guess in some ways you have to, to be closer to yourself if you're a CEO. You have to take tough decisions. Sometimes you have to fire a lot, a lot it's, of people. It's not about being close to yourself. It's about being realistic and assess and not being afraid of... You're not making friends by the decisions you're going to make, but that's okay. That's not why you're there. And I think that's really what it is. I also think that as a CEO, you take huge responsibility and you have to be someone who likes that. And you have to be someone who leaves the door at night and you go home and you don't leave the office mentally. And that's a huge part of being a CEO as well. It was when I was an MD at Bank of America. I, I often checked the markets, even I was closed down out of my office. And of course I did that, in fact, all the time. But, but I guess, Metalurgy, for example, I mean, not everyone goes and starts their own company like, like you did, for example. You must have some different traits than, than mm. the rest of us, so to speak. I mean, uh, what is it that differ you yeah. from the rest? Well, I probably do to some extent, but I think when we talk about being a leader, it doesn't really matter if it's in a, your own startup or if it's at Arla or somewhere else. People need to respect you on two different levels. Yeah. So professionally, they need to think, you know, that you, you know what you're doing, so you make the right decisions and, and you're good at what you do. But then I think just as important is the personal level. If people think you're a dick, you know, they're not going to work for you, they're not going to want to. And, and if you want real good talent, they can choose, so they can go somewhere else. Mm. If, if you really are a psychopath, <laughs> I don't think you'll, uh, you'll get very far uh, with uh, talented people. Uh, Peter Tuvo, what do you say? Yeah, I actually think that it, it, uh, I understand where it comes from, and, and there's no such thing in my, in my book as a psychopathic, psycho, psychopath characteristics. You're either a bloody psychopath or not. That's it. It's, it's one or zero. Uh, nothing the question is, are you or are you not, Peter? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, because then I wouldn't be standing here. I can tell you that. Uh, but I think where it comes from is some studies. Some of you might have uh, known this better than me, but I read that uh, many years ago, that, that amongst leaders, not only CEOs, but, also, but managers, there's a larger proportion of psychopaths. That's how it is. I think it's, uh, was it 10% or something like that? So what does that tell me? We have 1,500 leaders in Ala Foods. If that's a normal population, 150 of those would probably be small or big. Hopefully the bigs are gone, but, but have some of that. Uh, and we have to spy, uh, spot them and kick them out immediately because there's no room for them. But, uh, and probably uh, our proportion is not that big, but don't, don't, don't mix it up with being at times need to impose some raw will in your decision. That you, I, we need to do this because I say so. It, it happens very rarely in my time, but, it, but I, it, throughout the year I have to make these decisions. And, and, and to be tough in some decisions, we need to let go of this project and fire the people who belong to that project. Although we know that it's tough on them and they gave us you know, their mind and their heart. Uh, but it's how you then do it, that you do it in a proper way and that you don't enjoy doing it. And that's where you spot the psychopath. That's if there's some enjoyment in imposing that raw will. And then it gets, uh, then it gets dangerous. Luckily, I don't see them so often. Uh, but I see them and I can spot them. And it's bloody difficult and never get a boss with those characteristics. Yeah. He or she will eat your life. And you don't, even you don't even know it. You'll probably enjoy it while it happens. Karina, jump in. I, I, I'm, I don't know how many of you knows Dick Fall or heard of the name. He was the guy who took down Lehman. Single-handedly, he was the guy who was responsible for Lehman's failure. On the 14th of September 2008, there was a huge announcement in the financial market and probably the biggest breakdown ever. I think actually even the biggest collapse in US history. And he had those characteristics. And it's been known for ages, for years. He had run a culture of fear. In fact, he had his own elevator, so he didn't have to mingle with people like us. <laughs> he ran that company like that, and he had to pay people quite a lot more than the standard average market rate to, get to go to Lehman. But what he also did was he attracted people who had a mindset similar to himself. N now, I'm not saying everyone at Lehman was psychopaths. Definitely not. Um, but there are certain some types there that was not far away from what he gave to them as a leader. And I think it does exist. I mean, I'm sorry if I said before the question is not relevant, because it certainly is. Um, it's just rare. 
is rare that someone becomes a CEO. Now, let's not forget, he did build that company from scratch. He was a standard broker before being Lehman, being one of the big ones at Wall Street. Um, I do think that kind of stands out because we all heard of the Lehman uh, failure and what that meant to everyone else. Mm. Modest Stong, I think uh, this one, uh, you should have to, to answer this question as well. Not if you're a psychopath or not, but <laughs> has it, I'm wondering, has it changed you? Do you feel it changes your, your characteristics being a leader? I mean, do you have to, to roughen up in somehow? Uh, yeah, you do. At sometimes sometimes you, you need to take the awkward decisions and, and yeah, fire people or close down projects or whatever. Uh, and I think that uh, it's very true if you, if you like that, uh, and sitting in the, and, and taking an employee aside, if you like to do that, then uh, then you have a problem. Uh, but I also think that that companies today are is very much about people management and leadership, uh, and and uh, new startups and so on. So I don't think we'll s that's I don't think we'll see many psychopaths. As the lack of empathy and so on uh, won't work uh, as a. Uh, modern leader, uh, I believe at least, you won't, shouldn't be able to climb that high up the stairs at least if you don't have those. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, let's uh, leave the extreme characteristics uh, behind us for a while and, uh, and, and skip to the next question. Uh, I think we are, we've already talked about uh, strategic decisions you would do uh, in a different way. So um, actually, um, I think we'll go to this question. How do you incorporate uncertainty in your strategy? We don't know anything for sure, Peter Tubo. So uh, how do you foresee a satirical drawing in Jyllandsposten? Or what do you do with your strategy? Mm, I, I think there are different ways that one could, uh, could answer that question. Uh, th there's a whole risk management part of, of, of running, which is actually not a direct part of the strategy, but is you know an analysis and assessment of the risk that surrounds you. And I think that you can't specifically uh, pinpoint that uh, we need to close down uh, all our uh, Russian business because uh, because of what happened in R Ukraine. So, so, so don't try to predict exact ha things that happened, but that sort of you know what if uh, we have a, f a food crisis? What if uh, a whole market breaks down in certain ways that we can't predict? What would we then do? How would we work with it? And and we actually take that very serious and 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 have what we call. Uh, seven black swans that, 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 that we work with uh, that, that would really damage the company, uh, like what we've seen there, and where it can go all haywire and, and, and really be a, a big strategic problem. Uh, that, that, that's the kind of thing that interests me quite a, uh, quite a bit. But you can't predict exact what happens, but the kind of thing, uh, you know, a food scandal, that, uh, that somebody dies from our products because somewhere we didn't get it, uh, what will then happen, uh, how do we handle it, who handles it, uh, and, and are, is it escalated to me or not? Uh, th that's very precisely descri described uh, in other foods. And we took a lot of learnings from the Middle East crisis, from that where we did it more uh, by intuition. Suddenly I was there on the same day, so that was fantastic, so let's take it from there. But we have actually written it down, these procedures, uh, afterwards, uh, because we know, of all, all everybody actually, we know that uh, every year has its crisis. Strong, you've made a, a startup business, you sold it, now you've made an, a new one. How do you uh, calculate uncertainty when, you, when you're working strategically with Mofibo? Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in our strategy. Uh, we're building a new market. When we entered the market in Denmark, 3% uh, of the Danes were reading uh, e-books. Uh, uh, luckily today is something like 20%. Um, so I think that's I think what you have to is, is to make a clear plan of where you want to go, but, but be very agile on the way. Uh, and I think you can de-risk uncertainty by revising uh, your strategy during this process uh, frequently, uh, uh, so it doesn't strike you. I think a lot of it, of course, uh, sometimes it can strike you straight away and you couldn't calculate with it, but I think you can, you can de-risk the case a lot by, by revising your strategy more often and, 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 and uh, yeah. Do you do it systematically? Do you have a, a meeting every half year where you say, now let's, uh, let's uh, re review our strategy and look at how the market is evolving? How do you do it? Um, I think we have, the, we have the vision of the company, and then we have very much the strategy, 
but also, and then we we drill it down as as uh, he said as well in terms of Allah, uh, into specific initiatives uh, and must win battles. Actually, we learned that from CDC. Uh, so in every business line, saying what is it exactly the next three months, six months, and twelve months you need to reach of targets, and then of course we have KPIs which we have received daily where we where we measure these targets and where we're going and and so on. And then uh, every three months we follow up on our mushroom battles to make sure that the, the ones uh, we've, we've, which we lay down for the next 12 months, that they should still be the same. Uh, and during that process, wi which we do every three months, then we've, we, we find a lot of, of uh, new ways and, and, and uncertainties as well and, and uncover them. Uh, so we do have a process, process for it. Mm. Um, I think that's very healthy. That's what I learned from TDC, to be very structured in terms of, 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 of uh, with Muslim battles and, and, and revising your strategy uh, often and so on. What about you, Mirluga? I mean, uh, people are they're, um, exercising more, they're running more, they're biking more. I mean, your future must look uh, clear and bright, so I guess you don't need any uh, uncertainties <laughs> in your strategic work. Well, I think we have, we have several different like, mega trends that we are tapping into, and one of them is certainly health. And that's in pretty good shape because we, you know, <coughs> we want to be healthy to a larger, a larger, or larger extent. So that's that's fine. But then, when it comes to technology, which is the other main one, uh, that is where I see the ma the main potential risks because we don't know what's going to be the next defining pro product in connected fitness. Uh, so I always have a list in my head of uh, top three main trends, or you know, what could what could turn into a thing and how we address that. So we, we try to address that uh, uh, quite fast, or even in advance. There's one trend, for example, where we've now built a product, just in case that trend becomes a big hit, uh, <coughs> then we are ready with the product. We don't have to start from scratch. We are a year ahead uh, if that happens. And so we try to do that, but we can't do it with everything. So we need to pick our battles on that as well. And what if you miss, what if you're sitting there with a project and product that no one will ask for ever? Well, I kind of hope so. I think of it as uh, life insurance. <laughs> you kind of hope it doesn't really get uh, get relevant, but uh, and we can also turn it into a business at some point if mm. we if we had more resources. And uh, Karina, you're uh, you're from the investment banking world. You're a hardcore uh, investment <laughs> lady. I guess you don't uh, operate with uncertainties. No, I did it a pretty pretty extreme way. I hired a risk manager, um, and I did that because I'm doing food. Uh, and I got someone who is an as expertise within foods. And this person only deals with risk management in a risk versus an action point kind of way. So as a function of we assess the risk, we understand the risk we're facing if anything goes wrong. And we have an action plan according to that. Um, that makes me sleep better at night. It's a little bit overdoing from where we are as a, as a company now. but. We are, we are very ambitious and with our goal of establishing ourselves in US in 2015, we're not early with this. We should be in place with this. How, that's how I see it. Um, I made a few points in terms of uh, incorporating uncertainty. I think it could also be a positive. Now, we heard Meta saying that they have uh, created a product in case this trend comes up. I've also created things in case this is actually, if I see the world, the way I see the world happening in my market, if that happens the way I look at it, I'm ready to expand into a certain area. And I think that's a positive. So it's not just the uncertainty in the negative way, it could also be the possibility that something comes to play and being ready for that. Well, uh, I think that uh, concludes what we can, uh, what we have time for from questions from the audience. But um, before we go, you've all been asked to uh, to think about one short advice for the leaders of tomorrow. Um, what would it be? I think we should do uh, ladies first. Mirelugu, what's your advice? Um, well, the I have two. I'm sorry. I'll make them short. <laughs> the first one is just follow your passion wherever <laughs> it takes you. Just do that. And the second one is uh, make sure to sleep. Uh, every night, get your <laughs> sleep. When you don't get sleep, you make crappy decisions, people will stop respecting you professionally, and you become a bitch or a dick or whatever, and <laughs> nobody wants to work for those. So get your sleep and you'll be all set. Karina? Hmm? Um, I say one thing. If you're not prepared to be wrong, and if you're not prepared to make mistakes, you'll never be original. And coming from that, take the risk, 
take the risk all the way and a little bit more because chances are you convince someone on the way to go with you and that's where big things happen. Peter Tubo, I guess you get all your sleep every night, but uh, what's your advice? I have a one-year-old daughter, uh, <laughs> so I don't get all my sleep. <laughs> Find your inner drive, your passion, the same thing. Stay focused uh, on what you do. I've seen so many dreaming about the future and a better career than what they have today. And then you'll never get anything. Deliver results. It sounds boring, but sometimes I see people forgetting that. Belongs to the stay focused part. Choose your boss with care, not because you necessarily can be a psychopath. <laughs> There are not so many of those, luckily enough. But some bosses can actually help you uh, through your career. Mm -hmm. They'll make sure to spot you before you know that you're a talent yourself and bring you along and give you other opportunities. Uh, and some you are very protective and keep you, you know, in that bottle so nobody uh, discovers that you are good. And then, as I said this morning, Really make sure that you, one way or the other, get some international experience and don't be afraid to go out there and travel out there and see the world. And it's not, it's not Grand Canary I'm talking about. <laughs> Morten? Um, yeah, from my point of view, I think it's, uh, it's important to be extremely ambitious. Uh, I see a lot of people who talk about their ideas and, and plan and, and so on, but don't execute and don't just go do it. Uh, so a little less talk and a little more walk, I think, is extremely important. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's healthy to be ambitious, and I think it's important that you set your targets, uh, but at the same time, uh, be very honest uh, and humble. Uh, I think you get a lot further uh, by, by remembering that as well. So, yeah. Thank you. I think that's uh, excellent <laughs> advice. Uh, <laughs>